Okay, so let's get started. Thank you very much for uh, attending the session. Looks like um, a lot of people interested in JRebel. Um, so who, who here has used JRebel before? Okay, quite a few, awesome. Who's heard of JRebel? And everyone else is just here for the fun, right? <laughs> Excellent. So this is uh, this is JRebel under the covers. Um, how is it? How is it even possible? And, and what we're going to be talking about today is what really goes on, what really happens under the covers. How 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 JRebel manipulates the JVM to be able to reload classes on the fly. Um, this is my first time actually speaking at DevOps Poland, or well, I guess this is the first time for everyone speaking at DevOps Poland, but this is the first time for me speaking at thirty uh, third degree or DevOps Poland. So I'm really happy to be here. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, you can follow me if you like on Twitter, at SJMaple. Uh, I work for Zero Turnaround as a developer advocate. Um, Zero Turnaround create two products, JRebel and XRebel. Uh, we're going to be focusing on JRebel today. XRebel is more of a kind of profiling style product. Um, I'm also a Java champion, um, mostly for my work that I do with the VJug. Lots of people heard of the VJug here? Quite a few. Okay, so the, vir the VJug or Virtual Jug is an entirely online Java user group, um, and we try and just get the best speakers uh, to, to give us sessions, and so people can interact with them wherever they are. As long as they have an internet connection, we're, we're good to go. Um, also, Java One Rockstar speaker, and uh, I created the Virtual Jug myself um, about a year and a half ago now, so that's going really strong. So if you go to virtualjug.com, you can join that for free and, and attend some of our sessions. So this session is largely going to be based around, I guess, the, the a productivity tool that we created back in 2007. Um, and really, productivity means different things to different people. Um, you know, might see, you might feel productivity because you use a specific JVM language over maybe something more like Scala. Um, you might choose productivity based on the tool set you use or the integrations you have, the stack you have. Um, because obviously, I work for Zero Turnaround, and this session is going to be about uh, about uh, about JRebel, the focus of this productivity is all going to be about um, the Java, the Java build, compile, and redeploy cycle. Um, now, one of the most important things in in any kind of development really is that is that very very fast feedback cycle. And what we're talking about here is the ability to fail fast. And the way we fail fast is by pulling everything as left as we can in our process. We need to understand the information, that feedback, as quick as we possibly can so we can react on it. Um, and this is no different with something like the, the development process when we, when we try to develop any kind of code. Um, first of all, we need to understand that we're going to make a change to our code. So we're in our IDE of choice, whether that's IntelliJ, Eclipse, NetBeans. <laughs> one, one, one of the back. And Reza, maybe. Reza, awesome. Um, IntelliJ had it there, by the way. Um, you make a change in whatever ID you want, Vim. <laughs> um, then you go through your compile and build. Now this can take this can take some time depending on you know obviously how big your process is whether you're downloading the internet at the time um, and you know how big your changes are but the big point here is the is the redeploy particularly for those who are on the larger um, larger infrastructures the larger deployments this can take this can take anything from a few seconds to tens of minutes the the, the longest I've heard of was actually a remote environment which was an hour and a half for a full redeploy. Um, I guess no one in this room can beat that here today. No, good. Um, so yeah, th when this deploy happens, you typically take a break, you go to the water cooler, you grab a coffee, you Google cats, kittens, lots of different things. But one of the biggest things for me when I was working back in my IBM days, when I was, when I was you know, web developing, um, the biggest thing for, for me here is the, is the, is the loss of um, context switch, or, the, or sorry, the context switch which causes you a loss of focus when you develop. So you're developing your code, then you have a 10 minute break, then you have to try and remember which bit of code you're trying to test, then you have to remember where your brain was in the code at the time. So this is actually a slightly longer than the phys just the physical time. The average is from the from the information which we get back um, from a whole bunch of surveys and some of our some of our social uh, free social offerings is around three minutes for a, for a redeploy. So that's that's the f from changing your code all the way through to actually testing your code. That's around three minutes. Obviously, it can be a lot more or a lot less depending on your application size and your your framework. Then you actually need to observe the result. 
And when we observe the result, it's not just going to be as quick as, OK, I'm going to just check. Yep, that works now. Sometimes there's an amount of state you need to build up. Let's say, let's say you're on a, you created a wizard, and you're step 99 out of 100 is the step that you just coded. First of all, you need to log in. Then you need to create a whole bunch of state before you actually need to test your, test your code. This is, this is the very, very typical style of, of develop, Java development that we're, that we're used to today. Um, once you've done that and you realize you've made a stupid typo, you then have to go through the whole thing again. And this is, this is kind of day-to-day -day life of, of Java development, in a, particularly in a container. Um, this, is, this is some information which we've, which we've literally just asked people, people in, in surveys and things across a number of, a number of different reports. Um, and we can see that the time it takes people to do a, uh, oh, sorry, the time it takes people in an hour to do a redeploy or a number of redeploys varies greatly um, from a small number of people who say they take less than a minute every hour redeploying up to 5% of people who say, say they take half their time, over half their time in an hour just waiting to see their code. And you know, if anyone's like a PHP developer here as well as on their part time, you're used to that quick, just hit F5, refresh, and see your code instantly. Um, so this isn't a problem. But the majority of people are typically spending up to around 10 minutes um, an hour. So a sixth of their time is spent Googling cats and kittens. While that's great fun, it's not very productive. Um, State is one of the key things as well. Once we do a redeploy, it's very, very important to make sure that the state is consistent uh, across, that, across that redeploy. Um, and there are a number of things, there are a number of different aspects which, which we need to consider when we look at state. You know, whether, you're, whether your application is accessing a database and storing information in a database, that could be its state. So that when you do the redeploy, it might, it might be fine because the application just looks for its state in the database and it can continue progressing forward. Um, you might have temporary state, and temporary state might just be a cache somewhere. Um, very, very often, this is the kind of state that gets lost on a redeploy, because it's in memory, you lose it, you throw it away, and then you have to build up that state again. It might be preserved if this cache is stored externally, but nine times out of ten, it's, it's very local and in memory. Um, we also have your user sessions. So your user sessions, your HTTP session data, um, very often that would typically get lost unless you try and serialize it and then deserialize it afterwards. And this can cause problems in itself because, of course, you know, when you serialize something and deserialize something, the structure kind of needs to be the same. Otherwise, you effectively just can't grab that data back in and recreate it. Um, so that, that may be possible, but it depends on the kind of change. You also have uh, derivative states, uh, and this could be anything from config files to XML to properties, um, that kind of thing. Even if you have a stateless application, you might have state in, in somewhere else. So for example, in play, you might have some play config that changes, and when you redeploy your app, you might want to see those changes appear. Um, so, that, so state is an interesting one, one of the hardest pieces as well. So how can we reload a single class preserving preserving the state. Uh, well, this is easy. You just go to the class loader API, and you call the reload method. Uh, and everything works fine, and there's no need for JREBL at all. Um, except when you actually look at the class loader API, there is no reload method. Classes aren't designed to be reloaded. In fact, classes are, are kind of you know, these immutable things that once, they are, once you have created it, the JVM spec says it should always be there and always be the same. Um, per class loader. So the class loader API by design won't let us uh, mutate classes once they have been created by a class loader. So how do we go about currently, how do we go today without JRebel about reloading our classes or, or, or refreshing that environment? The typical way that this is done is you have your class loader, and typically your class loader is, is you know, created per application. So if you were to deploy an application, you'd have your own class loader. You then, on the first time you, you use your class, you will try and access your class. You will, you will load that class into, uh, into the perm gen or the heap. Um, then you can create a whole bunch of objects 
from those classes as you need. You can just spawn off many different instances. But as soon as you want to try and change this class, you can't actually unload that class from the class loader. You can't just load a new version of it. You actually need to destroy, or, or should I say replicate, um, this class loader hierarchy by creating a new class loader, a new class with your new definition. And then you can create your objects, any number of objects you want again. Typically, what you would do is you would just, however many objects are on here, you would just recreate that same number over here, and then try and pull that state across. That is what, that is what typically would happen. So how does this actually work? Here we have a more kind of enterprise application level. So we have a container. In our container, we have our class loader, one per you know, application, uh, typically. We have our servlet, which is loaded by our, by our web class loader. And that class loader, that, that, that servlet is going to have some state. We also have a bunch of libraries and classes. And then, of course, our session, uh, our, um, our data or our state, which is going to exist there in, in an HTTP session style form. So to recreate it then, we'll create a new class loader. Um, we would create some new classes and libraries. Um, we'd need to create our new servlet, and we'd, we'd, we'd call some kind of initialization on that servlet um, to create our new application state. So our, our, our state is reinitialized. Um, we would also have a, a, a new session, and that could be serialized or deserialized across to, 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 to maintain that session. This is one way, and then the idea is we kind of just remove everything on the left-hand side. So it's nice and clean. We've just entirely replaced our structure, except very often there are always some rogue classes which, get, which, which kind of get left, and the, um, uh, another Estonian uh, company, actually, um, called um, Plumber, uh, they also describe how you can actually kind of leak some application classes, which leak class loaders, and it can get very, very nasty. Their, their example is, uh, I think they were using some JDBC driver, which, which created a reference just in case of uh, a recovery being needed, and all of a sudden, it's that one link in which avoids some of this data, some of these classes from being garbage collected. Uh, and, and so what you effectively get is this massive tree which gets left over every single time you do a redeploy. And this leads to perm gen out of, you know, out of memory errors, perm gen out of memory errors, which I'm sure many of you have seen. So yeah, class loaders are great for isolation. Um, but for memory leaks, they're even better. Um, and, and reloading is, is not something that was ever designed by, you know, by, by, by design. So yeah. What happens if state is left over by the switch then? So here, we have some state. We have a reference which causes this object um, to still be linked and still be, still be part of the active, the active heap, I guess. This entire structure, because an object has a link to its class and a class has a link to its, its uh, class loader, will remain. As a result, the class loader has a link to every single class it has ever created and all of the static fields in those classes. And those static fields could actually refer to objects, and those objects could refer to other objects. And so you get this, you get this massive great group of classes and objects that potentially couldn't be collected as a result of this one link. And this is very, very easy, and shall I say very, very hard to avoid that link. So there is a problem uh, with, with, with the way that these, these republishes, I guess, occur today. Uh, any questions? Please just shout them out. Any questions so far? OK, cool. So hot swap. Uh, everyone's heard of hot swap, yeah? Anyone not heard of hot swap? <laughs> yeah? OK. So hot swap was created in 2002. Uh, it was actually um, a, a combination of a, a number of people who, who created this. Um, I believe some were involved, and I believe a guy or a number of guys from Glasgow University as a research project um, were doing this. And they, uh, in fact, it was a guy called um, Dmitriev, I think it was. Let's see. Yeah, Dmitriev. Um, and and he, created, he created HotSwap, which allows you, in certain modes, to be able to switch out uh, method bodies. Um, unfortunately, it's very restricted to two method bodies. So if I had, if I was in like a debug mode, I attached my Eclipse ID or IntelliJ ID into a debug mode with, with my running uh, JVM, 
Um, and I try to change the inside of a method body, so just the behavior within a method. Um, my runtime would allow that to be switched out and I could continue running. And there are a number of things which need to be, which need to be changed uh, within the runtime. And in fact, um, the, I've got some, uh, some notes here. The, 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 this, is the, this is actually a picture from Dmitriev's dissertation. Um, and, and from, according to Dmitriev, if you wanted to change a method body, just, just a single method body, so what, uh, what HotSwap does today, um, you would need to entirely destroy the, the constants pool. In fact, let me describe what this is. You've got the, you've got the instance class here, which is, which uh, all of this used to kind of like be in the perm gen before Java 8. Um, since, since Java 8, a lot of this has pretty much moved into, the, in, into the, just the general heap. Um, you have the instance class here, the definition of the class, which also has the, the, the constant pool. Um, and embedded, in line, in with this, with this class definition, we have the, the V table, the I table, things like that. And this is for, the, this is for uh, where uh, virtual methods and instance methods uh, or interface methods are described and placed in, the, in this class definition. So to change just a method body, the constant pool would need to be recreated and the instance class object relinked to, to all the constants. All native methods calling or inlining the updated methods would need to be deoptimized. So, in other words, any any methods, um, any methods that you would call, and where the code in this in this class would be inlined into that into that separate object or separate class, that would need to be deoptimized so you could so you could recreate the code in this instant class. Uh, the existing native methods need to include a software trap to be recompiled. And the object memory layout is not affected. This can be done uh, in the system thread to allow safe C++ heap updates. So, there, so according to Dmitriev, even, even what's available now is actually pretty destructive to, to, to you know, what's, what's available to us. Um, and that was just a very, very simple um, change. If we wanted to add virtual or interface methods, you would need to straight away update this vtable, update the itable. This then changes the size of the instance class. Um, and there are, there are other problems when we start changing sizes because we have to really then co focus on which garbage collectors um, we are using because different garbage collection algorithms will do different things. Some are absolutely fine um, just allowing objects to be you know, created anywhere they want. Other garbage collectors uh, care about fragmentation. So they try and, you know, or, or defragmentation, I guess, where they you know, pull all classes to one side, so they have a kind of like open heap and, and, and a packed heap. If you care about that kind of thing, then when you want to actually, you know, extend your classes, extend your class object, then you have to care about you know where where they're actually going because the idea of these kind of garbage collections where where instance classes um, don't change, they stay the same size. That's absolutely fine for a garbage collector because they don't need to they don't need to then find a new place as it grows. But, but if you were to kind of add new virtual or interface methods, then the size of it changes. So you need to think about where, the, where it's going. So even with, even with HotSwap, you have to care very much about which garbage collection is used. OK, so JRebel. Um, JRebel was really a tool that was created um, in 2007. And it was created really to try and bridge that gap um, between you know, where HotSwap is and where we want to be, which is that kind of PHP style of coding where you develop code, you refresh your browser, and you see your code instantly. Um, so I'm going to show you a very quick uh, demo of, of JRebel just so you can see, just so you can see it working. Um, I'm, I'm just going to do the, 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 the plain demo that many of you may have seen already, so sorry if you've seen this already. Um, I won't go into how JRebel actually attaches itself onto the JVM yet. I'll talk about that later. Um, but um, we've attached JVM, we've attached JRebel already to the to the uh, to the JVM, which means that if I wanted to, to to make some changes, so let's say I'll make two changes here: one to a Java resource and one to a, a, a Java class. If I change uh, a Java resource, so for example, this welcome text is is just a, is just a string which is being which is being pulled out of a messages.properties file. I can go into my messages.properties file, say welcome to DevOps. Poland, hit save, um, and then upon a refresh, um, we've done a number of things here. We've actually we've actually reloaded 
reloaded the resource, and we've actually cleared out a cache because typically a messages.properties is, is, is loaded once, cached, and then, and then constantly used. So we needed to reload that resource in, um, push, push a cache, and this cache is, is going to be independent you know, of, of the application here. This is really an integration with the application servers. So in this case, we're running on Tomcat, so we've pushed Tomcat to refresh, to refresh this, this cache. I can do exactly the same kind of change with, a, with some Java code. So if I click on this button, we can see a bunch of validation on this form. Um, if I go to the place where this uh, validation occurs, I could grab, I don't know, a number. Let's grab all of them. Let's, in, let's uh, extract that to a new method, which we'll call um, uh, validate, validate fields. Hit save. I can see at the bottom of here, um, just to show you something's happening, I'll, I'll comment out the first name. So we'll say that first name is optional. Uh, as soon as I come back to my runtime and hit add owner again, we've done that reload. Um, so that, that's what, for those of you who didn't know what Jerable does, that's, that's how Jerable works. Uh, it avoids that kind of whole build, compile, redeploy. Um, that's all I was going to show you for Jerable at the moment. Uh, I now want to go back here and we'll talk about how it does it now. There we go. So, um, first of all, what does it do? Well, compare it to Hotswap. Hotswap's really focusing on the method bodies because as soon as it goes away from the method bodies, it has to care a huge amount more about the size of the of the of the instance class. It has to care a huge amount about the the you know the V table, the I table, and all this kind of stuff. Plus, because this was originally a research project, um, it you know it, it didn't necessarily go too far. Um, Jerry bridges that now by you can add, remove methods, constructors, fields, annotations the vast majority of the, the kind of changes you want to do are uh, automatically reloaded by Jerable. So how does it work? This is what we're all here to find out, I guess. Um, Jerable has this core engine. Um, and in this core engine, it, it really focuses on the kind of uh, resources and classes. It also has an integrations engine, which cares about the frameworks um, and things that, things that sit on top of, of plain Java. Um, if we actually look at the the piece which you know which is which is created when a class is loaded, if we was to load a class A here, and this is this is what you would see in your IDE, this class would have an amount of state, an amount of variables, instance variables, static variables, and also an amount of behavior. So it would have method one, two, and three with various different return types, various different parameters. How Jerable would load that? Um, Jerable would actually transform that into two separate classes. Class A would hold the state and perform the proxying. Class A zero would create would call would have all the behavior. So we have a, we have a split here. We've split this class into state and behavior, and our state class is is doing all the funky proxying. Now. Uh, our, our name at the top, our class at the top, is actually called the same. We have the same class name. We only will ever have one of these. Um, as and when you continually make changes to your class and, and update behavior and that kind of thing, we will have um, a number of, of these different versions. And we'll actually version them 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Um, Let's take an example. Examples are always cool. So here we have public class C, which extends X. We have some state. We have a, a Y field. And we have two methods, method one, method two. Um, each method has one parameter. The first method returns an int. Second method returns a void. First method does a simple addition. Second method does a system out. So a plain, simple um, example. We'll first look at how we actually structure that in in terms, of our, in terms of our state object. In our state object, we have our, our field here, because that's, that's the state in the object, the state in the class, sorry. We then have our two methods. We keep the method signatures the same as, as the method signatures which we created uh, ourselves. 
Um, but what we do here is, the first thing we do is we create uh, an object array of all our parameters. So that if, if we decided, for example, our parameters change, what we're redirecting to won't change at all. We're just throwing a whole, a whole array of, of those parameters to it. Now we have this utility uh, runtime.redirect. And, and this, this allows us to effectively proxy to, to our, uh, our versioned classes. So here we actually pass a whole bunch of stuff. We, we pass the current object. Um, we, pass the, uh, the, we pass the array of parameters. Uh, we pass the name of the class, the method of the class, and also then the signature of the class. So this, this here is saying, uh, saying we have an integer, uh, an integer parameter and an integer um, returned. Um, and we do the same for both. So method one, method two has exactly the same, but this is uh, obviously returning, uh, a, uh, taking in a string as a parameter and returning back, returning back a void. So this is this is purely our state and and our proxying, our, our forwarding. Now class C zero, we do a number of things. Um, first of all, we turn everything just into a static method. Uh, this is our behavior. Not, no, there's no state in here. A, we can just put everything to a static method. Um, we also, um, for, our, for our, when we need a value, uh, we can just say get field value, um, passing, in, passing in the name of the value we want, and that will return, return its way back up to the, to the original C class for its state. Um, on method two here, um, we do exactly the same, so get field value. Um, but what we're actually getting here, um, if we were to go back to here, we're actually using systemout.println. And one of the things that we don't want to do is we don't want to make direct calls. We want to continually go through our, 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 this like, redirect layer so that as and when changes occur, we can be way more flexible in, 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 in the changes that we make to our code. So here, where we're saying system.out.println, what we're actually doing in our code is we are calling a redirect. We're creating a print stream, which is, which is the system out. Um, we're, we're, we're grabbing this system out here, um, and we're passing in um, the, the parameter s um, and we're gonna, and, and into an object array, and that's exactly what we pass into the redirect as well. So we're passing in that print stream into the redirect, and, and that effectively gets run externally. So all external calls uh, are done like this. Yes, it does add a tiny bit of additional overhead in, in expense of, of you know, calling this extra layer. Um, but this is, this is way more flexible for us in terms of how we make our changes continually going forward. OK, so that was, that was C0. So what happens if we wanted to make a change? Call, you know, maybe create uh, an extra method here, z, which returns 10. And then in our method one, we, we make a call to that method to, to add 10 to the value. Well, what we do is we create a new version of C1. Um, and notice that version C stays the same. Sorry, class C will stay the same. We create a new um, method. This method is, is, has the, you know, pretty much the same signature, apart from that it's static, uh, and that we, part, we take in this, uh, this new class. We return 10. We can return it directly because there was, there was no you know, variable or field access there. So we just return 10. And our method 1 now updates so that we make a, a redirect call to our new method, and then we simply do that addition. Now, we've got our new method here, z. On, on C1, but C still doesn't have that method. So what C is now working, how C is now working is as a dynamic proxy. So as new invocations come across to, to C, uh, we will make sure that call sites will invoke C using a dynamic proxy. So it will invoke, yes? If I'd like to debug the, the method I have before my eyes in the IDE, the changed version, I put a breakpoint in, in the new line, where will I end up? <laughs> That's a great question. So the question is um, all around debugging. So if I was to put a, the question was if I was to put a breakpoint in in one line of my code, where am I going to end up? Um, the answer several years ago was a very sticky place. The answer now, because we've got a lot of complex mapping between between you know where you actually are in this code and where you are in your IDE, we will actually do a reverse map to the exact line of code which which we believe you are on. In your in your IDE, so yes, you know it's not going to map one to one, 
Um, but uh, but we will we will do that mapping for you, and uh, and that's a supported feature in Jarable. So yeah, it, it works. And there are other there are other loads of other complications just like that. Um, but it but yeah, there, there's a there's a reverse mapping. Okay, and can we put uh, more debugging information than just the line number for for each uh, statement? Or uh, I mean, uh, you. I hit a breakpoint in, in class C1. Mm -hmm. And uh, how does it end up that, that, that the IDE shows me class C? So, so we, we have a mapping from C1 to your original class. We, we will understand when, when we are, so let, let's say for example, when we're on this line here, we will create a direct mapping back to this line, th th effectively this bit here, um, this call into Z. So we, we will, un we will when we make the changes, we, we keep a record of that mapping so that when you're in a debug mode and we're executing, we're at the, and the runtime is actually executing this line here, you will have that breakpoint here. So we have that, we have that in a map. Other things of interest like that is, for example, a stack trace. Because in a stack trace, you don't want to see C1. Right? You don't want to see JRebel code, which, which does this. We have to try and remove ourselves from all of, the, all of that kind of stack trace as well. So, so yeah, this is, it's under the covers, it's actually very, very complex to do this. But the idea is you as a user will not even see this happening. You will see when you, you know, you'll see that you're on the right line based on your execution. Just because we add these redirects doesn't mean we're changing the behavior of your code. So it's actually, you know, easier than it sounds to do that, to do that mapping. Um, but yeah, there are complications like that. Any other questions? Yes. Okay, so the question is, what happens if you have a profiler that attaches to the JVM that, uh, that transforms the class themselves? And you know, this is actually a more general question. What happens if you have any Java agent, anything that transforms classes? Um, essentially, JRebel is a, is a Java agent, and as a result, does do a whole bunch of bytecode instrumentation. Um, and this can be, you know, when you add multiple Java agents that do these kind of things, it can be, it can be quite dangerous. Because when multiple people are changing bytecode, not understanding there's someone else there who's going to change bytecode, you, you, can, you can find yourself in a mess. Um, so it is important that people who, who write this kind of software do test against other, other vendors, other people who create um, agents. In fact, we have... We have a Xrebel is a profiler in itself, and we actually we actually have an amount of work that we do to make sure Jrebel and Xrebel work together. So having multiple Java agents or multiple um, multiple frameworks or structures that that change bytecode, it doesn't mean it's going to break, but it doesn't. You can't be guaranteed that it's going to work. So yeah, it, it depends. <laughs> okay, so let's move on. So, yeah, so as I, as I mentioned, exceptions and stack trace, if we were to just throw them raw, um, you would see an exception coming from C1. You might see some, you might see some JRebel code in there as well. We actually have to remove ourselves from those stack traces. So we will provide you with a stack trace that you would see if you weren't using JRebel at that point. So we have to manipulate that to remove ourselves. Okay, so. In Jrebel, then, we don't actually have this, this second stack. We don't, actually, we don't actually create the new class loader. Okay? We can reuse the old class loader because we're, all we're doing is we're manipulating, we're manipulating the class object. So we can keep on this left-hand side. Um, and what we effectively do is we have this mapping. We, we have this mapping with our, with our source tree. Yes. Um, well, we're creating so that w with this with this class we do have you know this this I guess is a representation of C and all the C zero C one versions. Um, so what we're doing is we're pulling this class we're pulling this code into a new C one version C two version. The C version remains as our kind of proxy in our state, and we just add another version. And in fact, 
Um, the transformer, the transformer piece in the middle, which redirects, it can still use some of the some of the older versions. If if you know some of those methods weren't weren't touched, it will also, for example, if I had methods one to ten on C zero, and I created method eleven, if method five was created, the redirect would just move to C zero because method five is there. If method eleven is driven, it will then go to C one. So it will always pick the most recent the most recent version of that of that class. Um, so yeah, th there's this mapping, and let me show you. Let me show you that in a little bit of uh, a little bit more depth. Um, so the mapping, when you enable JRebel on a um, on a project, um, what actually happens is a Rebel XML is created, and this Rebel XML is effectively just a mapping between your runtime and your development environment. So what we have here is a class path and some static web stuff. So this class path is actually saying to the runtime, when the runtime loads this in your application, this is the one artifact which gets dropped in your application, um, it's saying my new classes are going to be found at this location. This isn't pointing to your source directories. This is pointing to your, your target directory. So if you were to do a Maven, if you were to do an incremental uh, Eclipse compilation, your class files will find their way into this directory. And your runtime, the runtime, the JVM, is actually looking, monitoring this directory. Um, so that such that if a new class finds itself in that directory, the next time, the very next time a class is accessed in the, in the, in the runtime, Jerobo will perform a very quick check into this directory. And it will say, is th does a newer version of that class exist? If it does, it'll perform that reload, it'll create the new version, and it'll, it'll you know, push that out across you know, all the cool sites and, and so forth and all the existing objects uh, uh, until the reload is, has completed, and then we will proceed forward uh, with, our, with our computation. Um, this, is, this is something which is auto-generated by IDE, so you don't have to create it manually, but you can do a whole bunch of things in here if you wanted, like exclude files, include certain files, and, and that kind of thing. And you can add as many directories and, and, and things like that as, as you want. Here we also have a bunch of you know, static content as well, so if you wanted to pull in CSS, JavaScript, and things like that, that can be, that can be achieved as well. Um, so we, we obviously when, you, when something like this is developed, there are going to be a, you know, a large number of challenges. Um, from the JRebel team, it's not just the number of integrations, um, the number of different JVMs we have to support. Obviously, there's things like OpenJDK, there's Hotspot, there's, there's IBM J9. Um, there are also you know, more, the, uh, some very technical challenges within, within the JVM which we needed to take a look at. One of them is static, static initializers. Um, basically, you can create you know, as many static initializers as you want all the way throughout your, your Java classes. Uh, you can create initializers when you create static fields. You can just say, you know, static blah, blah, blah equals this. They're all, they're all, that's all static initialization code. Um, what the JVM does uh, when, when it compiles the classes and so forth, it actually creates one single block, which is the CL init kind of clinit block. Um, and this, this is a kind of coagulation of all your static initializers. So if you was just to add a single static variable, with a static initializer. What do we, as JRebel, need to actually do to initialize that for you? Because all we have is a huge block of static initializer code. What, you know, do we run the whole lot? Do we run one piece? Um, and this is something which, which has been you know, a lot of trouble for us. Um, which is kind of like 90% you know, of the way there, 95% of the way there. But um, we effectively have to break down this, this static initializer block and only run the pieces which we believe are relevant to that, that, you know, that, that, that variable that you just created. Um, initialization, whether it's constructor or static as well, it's, a, it's something which is um, also a problem because initializers, they, they're kind of there to run once, particularly if you're in a constructor. Um, you know, constructors is run once only code. That's what Java says. If we run that multiple times and you really have code that is only supposed to run once, we could break your behavior. Um, here's an exercise for you guys then. Um, we have a class A. It's got, a, it's got a method called say, which returns one. We also have class B, which extends class A. Um, and it has a method that says say, and it returns two. Okay, we have our test method here, and this test method uh, has something of type A, but it creates, it creates the subclass B, 
and then calls say on it. So it's either going to return one or two. I'll give you a couple of seconds just to think about that. And we're going to see, we're going to see which you think test is going to return. So who thinks it's going to return one? Who thinks it's going to return two? Okay, very, very interesting. Uh, this is actually going to return one. Um, the reason it's returning one is because, okay, I should have told you this, but these are, these are package-wide package methods. Okay, if you, look at, if you look at the access modifiers on the methods, they're package. They're, they're, they're nothing, so it's package. Um, this is in package B. This is in package I should have told you this, shouldn't I? <laughs> isn't, it, isn't it interesting how we just miss these little things? It would have been so much easier. So yeah, I mean, you know, we, we don't have access to this package. We can't, we can't make this invocation. So we, have to, we, we invoke this one instead. So we return one. This is, this is massively hard for a J-Rebel to, to have to care about this because, the, you know, all of a sudden, we don't just care about, you know, where code is being changed. We also care about the call sites all of a sudden. Does this call site have access to this specific method which is being driven? Um, as, and when you, as and when you make changes from public to private to package to whatever, um, we try to keep up. We try to make 80 to 90% of these work. Um, Sometimes it doesn't work. This is, this is one of the big complications of J-Rebel uh, implementation. Concurrency, again, is, a, is another complication. Um, synchronized, for example, and, and volatile. Synchronized, um, if you create a method which has a synchronized, synchronized that, uh, modifier on that method, what we will actually do is we will remove it from that method. And we will create a synchronized block which covers all the code in that method. So it effectively does the same thing. But then it makes the it actually makes the method signature a lot easier for us. Um, from a fr <laughs> from a from an object wait and an object modify, there's actually a method reentrant style happening in this in this instance, and we have to be very very careful here because because JRebel could easily deadlock here um, on 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 the synchronization blocks. Um, so so you know. JRebel typically just relies on, on, the, on these kind of concurrency primitives working by themselves, but there are, there are a great number of considerations here that need to be taken into account. Serialization. Now, this is, this is way more complex than the kind of just having a stack trace. Right? We've bastardized this class into about 10 different classes, and someone's going to ask us to serialize this class? You want this as a, a single byte stream that others are going to understand? Um, <laughs> This is, this is super tricky, particularly when people override serialization methods and deserialization methods. Um, so this is, this is particularly hard for us just to try and create a byte stream that other people are going to understand from the list of classes that we've created. Plus, transient, we have to make, we have to make sure that we don't, when we actually do this serialization, we don't um, you know, add add state which which you have chosen that you don't want to be pushed across a wire. So serialization is a is a big pain, um, but we do handle it. So if you you know one, one thing that we actually do is we keep the serial version UID the same to to try and make it as as usable as possible or easy easy to migrate as possible, um, and we try and add our, our modified fields and methods to the very end of the uh, to the very end of that of that serialization stream. Um, reflection. Now, if you guys think reflection is hard normally, trying to understand what a, what a jarable mutated class looks like from reflection is, is extremely hard. Um, and in fact, this, this, is, this is the most complicated part of the jarable of, of work. And this, uh, the reflection API, the reflection libraries needed to pretty much be entirely rewritten by us because, you know, when, when you add a new method, a new class, a new field. We want we want the behavior to be the same if you were calling it directly to if you actually wanted to call it, you know, live in your runtime by reflection. So we needed to make sure that a lot of this is kind of going through the, the, the dynamic proxy such that if it's asking, you know, what are all the declared methods on this on this or declared fields on this class, you actually get the right number depending on how we have mutated or changed that class. So this pretty much had to be rewritten on, you know, on each on each JVM vendor um, to, to to allow this to allow, allow this to work. Um, 
Performance. This is another massive consideration um, because obviously there's a you know there's a huge amount of work that we do. There's a huge amount of proxying we do. Um, there's a huge amount of lookups that we do. Um, th here is some here is some information from the Spec JVM or Spec J 2008 results. Um, and here you'll see the darker the 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 values beneath is with JRebel. The values above is without JRebel. So there's a whole bunch of tests that will that will happen here. Um, and we're actually really proud at how performant we are. Um, the startup is typically a little bit longer because when we start up, that's when we actually try and instrument a lot of the classes, and I'll show that later. Uh, but it, you know, when we actually get into the flow, uh, our changes and our, and our checks are very, very optimized, very, very quick. A lot of the code that I've shown you, this isn't, you know, this is obviously isn't anywhere near the kind of production-style gerable code. There are a huge amount of optimizations to achieve this, um, and, and in fact, um, because because gerable trades some kind of CPU work for memory work. In some tests, weirdly and ironically, and this is something we never expected, um, jrebel is actually faster. Um, so for example, this, these are throughput, so this is all throughput, so larger numbers are bigger. So for example here, the throughput was actually faster with jrebel. Um, but this is obviously you know, a, a very minority case. The, in the majority of tests, jrebel will give you a, a, a performance hit, but it's thankfully very, very slight. Okay, so Java Assist. Um, we need to manipulate our bytecode. How do we manipulate our bytecode? Who, who's done bytecode manipulation here? Quite a few people. Uh, using ASM, Java Assist, ByteBuddy. You're just a hardcore, hardcore manipulator. Um, okay, so we use uh, Java Assist for a lot of our work. We actually use ASM a little bit as well, um, but Java Assist mostly for our kind of integrations. Um, and one of the things that we need to do is we need our entry point, okay? We need a hook into a JVM. And to do that, uh, we actually create a Java agent. Um, now, a Java agent is just a class. Here it is, doesn't even extend anything, um, but it has a pre-main method. Um, our pre-main method essentially has this instrumentation API, and this is crucial for the work that we're doing. Um, from this instrumentation API, it allows us to instrument classes. It allows us to change bytecode. So we can, in, in this pre-main method, we can add a transformer, and we use the class file transformer to, 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 to make changes to our bytecode. This allows us, when classes are loaded, to be able to take the bytecode that, that's there, transform that bytecode, and then pass it back to be loaded. So this is, this is like that very, very early hook, which gives us your compiled code, and we can throw out that same compiled code, but jrebel to compile code. Now, just having this class doesn't make it a Java agent. What we actually need to do, the key part, is in the manifest. So you can't just have a single class, which is a Java agent, just and, and, and call it somewhere in your, in your class path. It actually needs to be a bundled, uh, a bundled jar um, which has this manifest in it. And in that manifest, you just need the pre-main class uh, attribute, which, which calls the class um, you know, of your agent in that, in that jar. To actually run it, you just simply need to call Java minus Java agent and then the path, uh, the path to that jar. And then when the JVM starts up, um, it will load that agent. It will, it will then, you know, from the instrumentation API, it will add this transform, which is kind of like a, a, a listener. And then you can make your class transformations. So, <coughs> How do we, what do we actually create in our class file transformer? Well, the, the key part here is this is this class file buffer. This is this is effectively the byte array of your class. Um, from here, we have this. This is now this is now Java Syst. Um, you don't you know if you're using ASM, it'll be you know called different things. But what we do is we create this. We get this class pool. Um, this is effectively like a kind of like a class path. It, it, it generates you that that class path. And, and from there, we can make a class, and we, we pass in the um, you know the, the, the bytes of the class which is trying to be loaded. So this is, these are the bytes of your of your vanilla class. Um, what we then do is we pass it to this transform class method. We can do whatever we want in this method. This will now allow us to transform your class. So you know we can add our bytecode at the start, at the end, whatever we wanted to do. And then we return that as bytecode, and now that, that then gets created uh, as a class, and then you can then create 
instances from that. Jerable plugins is interesting. Um, now, we've talked a lot about kind of manipulating Java classes, but how many people, how many people use just Java without Spring, Wicket, Hi Hibernate, any kind of libraries or, or frameworks? One person, two, pe two people in this room, probably of around, I don't know, what, 150 people, 100 people? Only two people use the vanilla Java with just Java classes and just Java resources. So it's pointless if we say, let's do all this Java, let's do all this work, but as soon as you make a change to Spring, or as soon as you make a change to Hibernate, you're going to have to do a redeploy, because we don't understand the initialization. Um, one of the things that was key to how we work is that we actually have integrations um, and understand the initialization process of, of different frameworks. So. Let's let's choose this code for example. Here we have uh, here we have this 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 path at the top. This is a Spring annotation. Um, we have our we have our method foo which returns foo. We make a change. We actually return foo bar. Um, so Jerable will handle that just fine. Um, in fact, the Jerable core will pick this up. It'll update this. Everything's good. Um, but what happens with this path here? Okay. That you know we could change that, but without the initialization, without that, without that integration with Spring, um, you know this wouldn't be available as an endpoint. So what we can do is we have a whole bunch of plugins. We have over 80 plugins, um, which which will effectively understand things like annotations, the metadata of your classes, and so forth. So by understanding by understanding this, we actually look into the we actually look into the, the to the Spring implementation and call specific pieces of code which will reinitialize this bean. So if you know, for example, an endpoint changes, we call the reinitialization code in 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 Spring, which will make that endpoint available. Um, Unfortunately, the Spring guys don't have a single method which is just called reinitialize, which you can call again and again and again. So we have to actually understand which pieces of code are run once and which pieces of code we can run again. So this is, this is you know, a very complex part. Um, we ha as I say, we have over 80 of these uh, plugins. Yes? That's not a Spring annotation. I'm not sure Spring Oh, uh, this? I think that's a Spring annotation. Any Spring people who've used? It will be request mapping. Oh, request mapping. Okay, this is this is probably an older deck actually. So yeah. Um, okay. So, but yeah, you can also there's also there's also a um, an SDK which will allow you to actually create these plugins if you choose. So you can effectively be prodded by JRebel to say, actually, when this specific piece of XML or this annotation does change, I want to know about it, and I can then call a bunch of reinitialization logic. Um, how am I doing for time? Oh, about 10 minutes left. So let's, let's go very, very fast now. Remote, what, everything that we've talked about is, is so far very, very local. So if I wanted to make a change, in fact, let me show you a, let me see if I can do a very, very quick spring change for you. Um, da, da, da. Right, what we're gonna do is every time I, every time I create this, uh, this new form that I just showed you with all those uh, inputs, we're gonna try and pre-populate uh, a piece of work. So I'm gonna go to my, my runtime, my, my IDE, sorry. And in this, in this uh, package here, which basically just has a whole bunch of uh, POJOs, I'm gonna create a new Java class my Jerable Bean, very, very simple. It has a single field, a getter, and a setter. Um, I'm going to save that, and I'm going to invoke that from, actually, let, first of all, let's make that a job. Let's make that a Spring Bean. Um, and if, sorry for any hardcore Spring people here. I'm actually going to do it via XML. Um, I'm going to go to the, I know, <laughs> sharp intake of breath. Um, here we go. I'm going to uncomment this. This is a great new way of uh, developing. It's called development by uncoding, uncommenting. Very, very few bugs. Um, so what we've got here is we've got uh, we've got a new bean called JRebel Bean. It's going to it's going to use that class I just created as my implementation. Um, and there's a new bit of property injection here where the name field is going to be called zero turnaround. That's that's the value it's going to be given. So if I go to the my JRebel Bean, uh, what we're effectively doing is turning this into a Spring Bean and injecting zero turnaround there. Nice and simple. If I go to the add owner form, if I actually go to the code, uh, 
this is this is this is effectively the class which is used to create that to create that view. Um, and I'm going to auto wire uh, a new instance variable, my variable bean. Um, so Spring is now going to create create me an instance of that of that bean. Let me import that. There we go. And what I'm going to do is on the on the setup form method, um, we're gonna we're gonna set the the value in the first name uh, input box to be the value which has been injected into our new Spring Bean, which should be zero turnaround. So I save everything. Everything looks good. All I need to do now is come back, click Add Owner, and then we have zero turnaround there. So you know what has actually happened under the covers? If I go to my if I go to my console, what you'll actually see down here. What you'll actually see down here is uh, some reloaded bundles. I've changed the owner validator class, yeah. Um, but what I've actually done is I've reconfigured some beans. So I've reconfigured a JRebel bean. This is running through the initialization of, of Spring. So we're not just reloading, we're not just reloading stuff, we're reinitializing it so the rest of the environment is aware of the new beans and can make use of them. Um, very, very quickly then, before I finish, um, yeah, we, we, one of the other pieces I talked to you about was remoting. Now, remoting is the ability to have a separate server to my client machine. So if on my client machine I make some changes and I have a remote WebSphere or WebLogic or Tomcat or whatever it is, what we actually do is we, we, we push code changes across um, using the you know, HTTP or HTTPS across to the same context route of that, of that application. And it will save those changes locally on the file system. And then it's kind of very similar to JRebel working locally. So you don't actually have to, to use you know, your IDE and your server on the same machine for this kind of thing to work. OK, so I only have a few slides left. So let's spin through them very quickly. Um, So what's the what's the impact of all this then from from our users I guess um, well they're not waiting for redeploys anymore I guess um, if we actually look at some of the some of the the best uh, feedback we've got um, we actually have the, a couple of these as, as case studies network associates say they saved around just over forty percent of their of their iteration time in fact that was a, a forty percent increase in velocity that's right. Um, so they could actually claim 40% more velocity points over their iterations, which is something that they measured using Jerable compared to not. Um, and uh, the heliocentrist guys, who was using Netty and Spring, um, saved over 50% of his time. This is obviously the kind of like high end. You know, not everyone's going to reach these. Typically, you're looking at anything from around 15 to 17% on average um, time saving, um, based on based on the numbers, literally the numbers that we get back. Raw numbers we get back from from the amount of time people save during during redeploys. That's everything I have. Uh, if you have any questions, you can contact me at S J Maple or drop me an email. Uh, any questions in the room? Yes. What is the overhead of the code cache? On the code cache. Um, so we're probably looking at about uh, about five percent or so. Actually, given everyone's going, I'll just say uh, I'll just say thank you very much for the session. Thank you very much for all coming and. Um